now to uh, prepare for the act action of uh, discussing Dharma tonight, then we should try to uh, motivate with a mind that has uh, refuge, confidence in the, uh, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and the ultimate mind of wishing to achieve Buddhahood, to uh, actualize our own potential, to become enlightened, to become Buddhas, in order to be fully qualified to guide others out of suffering. So, uh, as those who were here last week, the, this th series of three talks uh, on Buddhism is presenting the reality that life is not as pleasant as we would like it to be. And we began by talking about the Buddhist presentation of things. Where everything that exists is either something which does not change moment by moment, or something which, or things which do change moment by moment. So this changing moment by moment is really the beginning of the presentation of causality. The why we exist, why things happen. I think, well, I'm not familiar with a lot of religions, but the Brahmanic religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity all propose, or all ascribe to the theory that everything originated from a, a single being called Jehovah, or God, from the beginning, well, it doesn't say actually where God came from, but uh, at least this earth began as the, uh, the purpose of one being. In India, too, the predominant philosophy was that everything came from one being called Brahma. Buddha who lived two and a half thousand years ago in India. He grew up in, in, the, in the tradition. Um, he uh, left the, the palace. He was born as a prince. And instead of becoming the next king of that region, he became a wandering ascetic, studying under the greatest teachers uh, of the time, learning all that they had to teach, but still not satisfied. In the fundamental point of causality, when we say that things such as our bodies and our minds, all the physical phenomena of the world are constantly changing, this indicates that they, everything has arisen independence upon accumulation of causes and conditions. And in the process of causes and conditions giving rise to a result, then the causes and conditions come to an end in, in, in bringing about the result. Why? How do they come to an end? Because they're changing moment by moment. And so there's tremendous number of different factors. Uh, we know from the physical world, you know, chemical change, physical change, and so on, uh, biological change, that things do so in dependence upon causes and conditions. So each thing that has arisen newly has this property of changing moment by moment. And results become causes in their own right giving rise to future results. So this is the nature of uh, things which are physical and mental. We did mention a third category of things which change moment by moment. And this refers to things which are not physical, they're not uh, 
mental, and that refers to uh, things which we acknowledge as existing, such as time. Time is something which we will agree that you know this year is such and such a year, and today is such and such a day, and the hour is such and such an hour. So time exists, but it's merely a, a, a ascribed to the observed passage of past to present to future. So we, we can divide uh, one day, you know, the the cycle of the the apparent cycle of the sun around the earth as the earth spins, 24 hours. We break it up into 24 hours. But there's no entity which is time in itself, which is independent of the uh, our mind, the mind giving a name to a, an observed condition. And so that we, we mentioned various things which belong to that category. The most important one is our own self, our own person. What am I? So, when we check out, we all were born with this sort of innate feeling that, well, I am me, I am here, this is me. And we see a photograph, that's me. We see the reflection in the mirror, that's me, my face. I own that face. I, uh, uh, you know, I possess all these possessions and so on. So we're quite comfortable with this uh, vague feeling that I am here, that there's me and you and him and her. They're different entities in strong connection with the body or the sound of the voice. That's the person. But if we really check out, if we do exist in that way, as a true entity, the, the real me, if the real me is really here, the, the, the I that we want to discover, the I that we know exists, and unfortunately other people don't know the real me. As our, one of our ex-Prime Ministers, Julia Gillard said, when things were going not so well, the people don't understand the real Julia. So we, we convinced there's real, and actually the real me is very nice in our mind. You know, we, we think we're much better than what other people think we are. Or well, sometimes mistakes, but that's not the real me. The real me never makes mistakes. So we have this idea. But that is the root of all of our problems. Because if we check up, well, the real me seems to be related to the body and mind. So we check up deeply whether there is a real me somewhere in this body. And there's nothing, if there were a real me, it should become clearer and clearer as we investigate. But actually, the opposite occurs. It disappears. There's nothing we can pinpoint to be a real me. And in our mind, similarly, our mind is the stream of uh, awareness, the, the various types of awareness through our five senses and through our mental consciousness, our thoughts and ideas, we check up. Sometimes the mind's happy, sometimes it's unhappy, sometimes it's, it's loving, sometimes it's angry. It's constantly changing. Knowledge comes and goes. Dreams come and go. So many mental experiences come and go. So if there is a real me in the mind, there should be something constantly unchanging, which is exactly me. But when we check up our mental experience, there's nothing we can find. If the real me were a third entity separate from the body and mind, like 
totally independent, then we couldn't say that, that the person is male or female or is young or old or healthy or unhealthy because those or happy or unhappy those are mental and physical situations which if the me or the I is a third entity separate from the body and mind you could not say that the I is those or has those experiences and if it were if there were a real eye it should be findable we should be able to locate this third thing which is neither body and night which is me but if we check up then there's nothing which we can find and hold up now this does not mean we don't exist this is the very important point I, I mentioned last we are just reviewing last week so I mentioned that the person who does exist is established independence upon the name given to the to us when we were a newborn baby given to that body and mind which is the new baby so At that time, say baby John or Joan, whichever, baby John, before the parents, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, decided to call their baby John, the baby John Smith did not exist. Right? John didn't exist. It was only when the parents decided to call their baby John that the person, this new person, John Smith, came into existence. Now, th there was a person, but it wasn't John Smith, right? So, from that moment on, people asked, oh, lovely little boy, what's his name? John, oh, lovely. So people began to recognize this new person as John Smith, but not just as the label. As they became more familiar with this John Smith, when this person would walk in the door, young John, people immediately felt that there was an inherently existing John Smith, a John Smith existing in his own right, a real John, which is neither the body or nor the mind, but closely identified, coming in the door. Here's John coming in the door. And they're not thinking about the body or the mind. They're, 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 what, what appears to us is John existing independently of everything, a real entity, a real me. The conventional reality is that we are all, everything exists merely nominally, independence upon a name given to a base. So, you see, from that point of view, when the base, the body, is sick, then the person labelled upon that, John, is sick. But there is no John separate from the body and mind, nor different. John is just a conventional entity, but he exists. As long as that body and mind, which everybody agrees is John Smith, can be called, you know, suitable to be called John Smith, as long as that exists, John Smith exists. When the body and mind uh, die then John Smith doesn't exist that's John Smith's body in the coffin and going to be buried but that actually is not John Smith in the cemetery John Smith has ceased
to exist entirely. The body, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But the mind, the mind which was connected with that body, is not a physical entity. Mind, as we mentioned last week, is a mere continuum of clarity and awareness. Clarity refers to the fact that whenever we're aware of something, our mind takes the aspect of that which we are aware of. You know, especially if in our thoughts we're thinking about something, then there's always a mental picture of what we're thinking about. When we're seeing or smelling, when we're conscious of smells, sights, tastes, that consciousness of the taste is taking the aspect of the taste or the sight or the sound or the touch. So that's what clarity means. And that, what you can say is similar, an analogy is like a mirror. A mirror, the reflecting surface of the mirror takes the aspect of whatever you put in front of it. It has that capacity. Whatever physical object, colours and shapes, the reflecting surface takes the aspect so our mind takes the aspect more than of just colours and shapes, which are objects of eye consciousness. It, it takes the aspects of sounds, of smells, and touch, and taste. Right? That's a defining characteristic of mind. The second defining characteristic is awareness. Now, awareness refers to the activity of cognitive engagement or knowing. Like a mirror does not know what it is reflecting. So the analogy breaks down. You know, There's no knowledge whatsoever in the mirror. Even you have mirror, mirror on the wall <laughs> is the prettiest of them all. I, I don't know where that story came from. But knowing is a defining characteristic of mind or consciousness. It's, it's synonyms, mind and consciousness. Is that clear? That, okay. So, there is, in our awareness and consciousness of things, the, and, and awareness includes our emotions. The things either please us, we're happy, they displease us, we're unhappy, or neutral, neither happy nor unhappy. Anger, love, you know, the, the constructive emotions of generosity, patience, and so on, and destructive emotions of anger, attachment, pride, jealousy. These are all mind. But there are no physical characteristics. You can't bottle up love or anger or knowledge you, you can't ascribe any physical qualities to mind okay our mind exists in dependence upon our body and our nervous system so here we have causality causes and conditions so major conditions for our human mind or consciousness to be uh, uh, manifest are a functioning body, an alive body, sense organs, a brain, you know, peripheral nervous system, central nervous system. These are main conditions for human consciousness. But as human, as consciousness in general has no physical qualities, it can't be measured, it can't be located, it can't be bottled up, it is simply clarity and awareness, which exist. Right? That, 
You're hearing these words. You're thinking about the meaning of these words. You're feeling the warmth of the day and any physical discomfort or physical pleasure. That, that experience is your mind. That is clarity and awareness. But it has no physical characteristics. But it exists. Buddhism says everything which is changing comes from causes and conditions. So our body, the, the material, or we say substantial causes of our body are, we know, that the food and drink that we've ingested, the air that we breathe, these are physical causes which come together to give rise to our body. including the sense organs and the brain. But mind exists, you have mind, you have awareness. What is the substantial cause of your mind? Physical things can only give rise to physical things. So mind not being a physical thing, its substantial cause can only be a previous, you know, the, the sub substantial cause of the present moment of mind is necessarily a previous moment of mind, of consciousness, awareness. And that previous moment came from a moment prior to that. So mind is a stream of awareness, of subjective experience. That is our mind mind has its own continuum just as the body has its own continuum the physical matter which at present comprise our body we know change you know uh, there's chemical change etc and, and uh, decomposes ashes to ashes dust to dust but never disappears as the present moment of the body changes it gives rise to the next moment of the body. It's not exactly the same body, moment by moment. Although we think this is the same body, but actually it's not. We know, yes, we know, we get old, we age, we get sick, but still, underlying that knowledge is the belief that this is me. <laughs> Wrong idea. So, what I'm saying is that John Smith, the baby which was going to be called John Smith, had a mind. And that mind also was present in the womb. Where did it come from? It necessarily came from mind, from previous mind. It can't have been created by the nervous system because they're different types of things, the physical world and mental experience. So this is how Buddhism presents the process of rebirth, that when we die, when John Smith died, although his body disintegrated, his mind did not cease. It became extremely subtle and born also on a very subtle physical support it's separated from the mind from the body at death experience sort of woke up in an intermediate state called the bardo and eventually connected with future parents according to the karma that ripened when it died so this process of the mind experiencing a, re a birth and then dying and then a new birth or intermediate state, new birth, dying, new birth. For each of us, our minds have been experiencing this since beginningless time. Beginningless. There was no beginning. In the Abrahamic 
religions that I mentioned, they believe that no, God created everything. And there was a beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. In the Buddhist texts, and, the, and uh, I'm thinking of a particular text called the Abhidharma Kosha, the, the treasury of knowledge. The chapter on karma says, there is no beginning. All the worlds, the environments throughout the universe and the sentient beings who inhabit those environments all are manifestations of the karma of those sentient beings. So, karmic causality is an essential aspect of Buddhist teachings. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I have to refer to notes because I don't have inner knowledge of karma. It's incredibly subtle. But as we go through, as I always say, you're welcome to put your hand up, ask questions, and uh, hopefully nobody gets left behind. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you say mind has its own continuum. Yes. As does body. But body can influence mind and mind can influence body. So they're interconnected. Yes. So they don't have ownership themselves. One doesn't, their mind doesn't have their own body. My mind doesn't have its own ownership. Yep. My body doesn't have its own ownership. No. You, you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because causality, we talk about causes and conditions. So when I mentioned the uh, substantial, which cause of, of consciousness of mind, there is a, it is necessarily a previous moment of consciousness or mind, it gives rise to the present moment. But the conditions, the body, the, the weather, the food we take, these conditions change the uh, type of awareness, whether we're sick or healthy, um, and so on. Many conditions. Okay, so literally, karma means action. And in particular, it, it refers to mental action or intention, intended uh, thoughts or the, the intention that exists in our mind, the purpose that exists in our consciousness. And whatever we do physically, and whatever we, we speak, the words that come out, they're secondary to mental purpose. We, there is purpose behind our actions, physical and verbal. This purpose, when we're talking about karmic, cause and effect, the intention is related to the causality, the causal side of our experiences. So, um, if, you know, sometimes we, we have a, we, our mind might be very upset, very angry, and somebody has um, been the object or is the object of our anger and we see them and the mind sends a message to, to the mouth to insult them right, to, to say something to hurt them right? the anger is an aggressive uh, attitude a, an attitude wanting to hurt or push away or remove the object of dislike. Now, sometimes we, we can say something out of love which will hurt people, but that's a different ball game. 
We're talking about an angry person, an angry mind, who says, who insults, who um, uh, says something really bad to a person, wanting them to be hurt. The immediate result is that the person is hurt. We have achieved our anger. The, the intention was accompanied by anger. So we achieved our purpose and we've, we're okay with it, we're glad. That's the immediate result. But that very action of shouting at somebody, cursing them, has left an impression upon our mind. There are many things we have said in the past, hurt people, and now if we, we even 20 years later, 30 years later, we think about it and the, the mind isn't happy. Hopefully. It has created an impression on our stream of consciousness. Now, two things, when we do such an action, two things occur. The, you say, the, the seed of anger itself in our mind is strengthened. We will become, we're more likely to be angry in the future. In a more subtle way, an imprint or an impression or a potency, a potency has been established on this mind stream. Like any seed or potency, it means it has the potential to bring about an effect but it remains dormant until sometime under changing causes and conditions in the future the, that potency of the action of verbal insulting somebody brings about a result. Now, that result there are four ways we can talk about the resultant side of karmic cause and effect. We've talked about the causal side establishing a potential in the mind stream. The resultant side, the big result, can be that that karmic potency can ripen at death and determine what type of rebirth the mind will take where it will go in the future. Just as if during life, if it comes to mind, the memory, just the memory of having hurt somebody, that's not the karmic imprint. It's just the memory. And that can cause us a bit of angst, a bit of tension in our heart. And when we die, the karmic potency can colour the mind in a particular, in a, that negative, destructive attitude of wanting to hurt, but then we're dead. But that last moment of, when we have some discrimination as we were dying, that is the cause. We call this the rebirth result of that potential. It can, it can it colours the mind so that in the intermediate state between one life and the next, one already, like in a dream, one, one, one's body is in the aspect of the rebirth resulting from that karma. And as it's a, a negative karma, it will be an unhappy rebirth. The lightest unhappy rebirth is an animal. The next severe one is what we call a hungry ghost or preta, and the most severe rebirth is uh, equivalent to what we understand as the hell realms, a hot or cold hell. Couldn't, couldn't, sorry, couldn't you control your mind? Yeah, well, that's the point. <laughs> this is the whole point of the talk. Yeah. We must control our minds. Yeah, and we can. Do we come to that? This is the need. This is the need to control. 
about the need to control it. The need to control it. Well, we don't want. It, it would be better to be reborn at least, at least as a human, or as a divine being, in in a heaven. But even that's only temporary happiness, because we will die from that happy rebirth, and we don't know what karma will come in the future. All right. So I'm just talking about the general what occurs when we don't know what's going on. There is a solution, but we have to know what the problem is. And we do not know the problem. That is our problem, that we don't know it. So I'm trying to explain the problem, as Buddha explained. Suffering is not caused by God or Brahma. Suffering comes from our individual karma. Happiness, bliss, are not caused by God or Brahma. They're caused by our own karma, our own actions, our positive actions. We have to know that. We think, oh, happiness is out there. You know, happiness is to get things, to get friends and partners and children and jobs and money and possessions. There is happiness for my football team to win. But there's no guarantee. As we mentioned last week, the eight types of human suffering. Okay, so I'm talking about the resultants uh, side of karmic cause and effect. So the big effect is the rebirth result. That's not the only result. If we have that unhappy rebirth, eventually, that, that rebirth karma will wear out. And as the mind stream carries unbelievable, unimaginable number of karmic potencies for both good and bad, or virtuous and non-virtuous actions in the past, eventually, even if we go to hell, that karma will be ex exhausted, and there's a possibility for a lighter karma to ripen at the death. And eventually, we can be born human. So, it can be way down the line. Our mind still carries that karmic potency of that when we swore at somebody and hurt them deliberately. So, it now, during that human life, this is like, for example, there two more results can come. One is the result similar to the cause in terms of our habitual action. So, this new human person who is human because of the ripening of a different karma, a virtuous karma, they got the human life, but their mind was not a, a clean slate. It carried the unripened potencies from past lives. So things good and bad happen during that human life. So there will be the, the tendency to swear at people, to abuse people, to hurt people verbally. That is a karmic, that tendency is a karmic ripening result. One of the four. The second in that human life results similar to the cause in terms is similar to the cause in terms of our experience that people will abuse us. This is a karmic ripening result from way back when we abused somebody else. This is just talking about one karma. Uh, of harsh speech. The fourth type of karmic result is the environment. The environment will be unpleasant. There will be uh, unpleasant things will be experienced. So environmental things we don't want. These, if one has the, the wisdom of a Buddha, every single unpleasant experience has a karmic cause, is a ripening result of a karma that can be identified. 
by a Buddha's mind. So those are the four. We'll come at causal side is the intention, the purposeful action. So intention itself is not karma in its own right, but it's similar to karma because our intentions are always accompanied by a, a positive or a negative emotion or attitude. Where our intention is accompanied by kindness, generosity, then we intentionally help somebody, then you get the four types of result. The rebirth result is a happy rebirth. The result similar to the cause is that the new person from their mind they will be naturally or naturally uh, generous. They won't have to be taught to be kind and generous. They will have this karmic tendency. People will be generous to them and kind to them. Good things will happen. And the environment will be pleasant and rewarding. If one's a farmer, the crops will grow or you know, things will go well. All right? So that is, in a nutshell, karmic cause and effect. First, yeah. Oh, you, you go first and then Adam. The current situation in Australia with the bushfires. Yeah. Can we have a, a group identity in group karma for a country? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're our beings, not only the people, but the koalas and the kangaroos and the, all the insects, collectively to experience that devastating fires, destruction of the environment. Is, we talk about collective karma, in that the beings who are affected by a common uh, problem, they have collective karma from past lives. So they're to us. Huh? Be linked to us and maybe the camera also, the koalas and... Oh, yeah. We've been using a human as an example, but animals... Every being with mind has... I mean, not talking about Buddhas and, but, and Bodhisattvas, but ordinary beings, they're all affected by karma. Every ant, every insect, has karma, has a mind which can be a human mind depending on the condition I mean I often use the analogy like a thought a, a literal thought experiment you know, Albert Einstein was good with his thought experiments if we imagine transplanting a human mind into a rabbit's brain that human mind can only function at the level of a rabbit because its, it's ability to have wisdom and knowledge, etc., and, and constructive emotions is limited by the simplicity of a rabbit's brain. But if you transplant the rabbit's mind into a human brain, that rabbit's mind now with its brain, can function as a human mind. Really? Really. Because every, the tiniest insect has the Buddha nature, has the potential to become a Buddha. And the only thing which limit that potential, or prevent that potential, are external conditions, we might be humans, but we're countries at war, etc., and there's no chance to receive teachings and study and meditate, etc. They can be internal. The mind itself. You know, the, the karmic imprints, the seeds of anger, of selfishness, of ignorance, of jealousy and pride and attachment. These carried on the mind, these are internal obstacles to, to Buddhahood. But we can do, going back to Jenny's question, 
we can do something about it because these internal obstacles are states of mind and karma is not a state of mind but karmic potencies can be purified you know, negative ones oh yeah Adam <laughs> um, so karma does karma make any allowance for being in the wrong place at the wrong time as if, for example two completely independent individuals travelling on their own paths John Smith riding his bike to work one day this truck right here they met and met this is the first time the meeting's ever been on the road um, yeah or tourists going to look at a volcano. Okay. Going back to the karma, which um, ripened, like we're all, when we died in our previous life, a karma, a virtuous karma, ripened, and this is the result, our human body. Now, not only is the, the, the type of rebirth a, a karmic result, but also at the time we died, associated with the ripening of that karma, our lifespan was determined. Each, but John Smith, was born with a karmically determined lifespan. It could have been a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever. When the karmically determined lifespan is finished, John Smith will die. No matter the best doctors, the best medicine, everything, John Smith will die. We cannot live beyond our karmic lifespan. Not only that, Our gender is also karmically determined at the end of the previous life. Can one die before their karmic time? Sorry? Can one die before their karmic time? Karmic time? Yeah, well, we're coming back to that. <laughs> that was the answer to your question, but I just thought I'd throw in this one because it's quite interesting. Whether one will be born as male or female is uh, there, there is a karmic, how do you say, ripening result, that, 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 sorry, ripening cause that occurs as we were dying in the past life. Now, that means that in the intermediate state, one's body will be male or female. So, I say, you're going to be born human, male or female. And then it's said that the, there is attraction, that like karma connects you with future parents. And it's said that the, uh, the intermediate state being, which is a bit like a dream state, but has a vision of the future parents. And it's said that if the karma had ripened to be born female, that the parents will be seen in the vision as engaging in intercourse. They not, may not necessarily be doing that, but that's what they see. So if it was the karma had been uh, for masculine gender, there will be desire for the future mother and aggression towards the future father. And if one's karma had been female, there will be desire for the future father and aggression towards the future mother. The desire will uncontrollably attract them to the point where conception is going to occur with these parents. The aggression causes death of the intermediate state being, and so the mind goes right down to the most subtle point, and then enters the womb around about the time of conception. So you have the three factors, the sperm, the egg, and the stream of consciousness coming together. Now, whether the sperm has an X or a Y chromosome, I don't think is karma. So, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. But this could well explain why some children have a psychological gender of the opposite to their physical gender. Uh, but this, the psychological gender is not fixed. The physical gender is. So we can accommodate. Uh, I mean, most young people uh, have desire for sexual um, enjoyment. Doesn't matter where it comes from. <laughs> How much of that though is programmed, as opposed to well, instinct? It's very. I, I cannot say that. Uh, what is the karmic scenario behind this? But that was just one. I just brought this up because the ripening of the karma that brings about a rebirth is not simply the type of rebirth, but there's the lifespan and then also the gender that they can be changed. Now back to your question. The, when our lifespan is up, it can't, this is in ordinary beings. In Tantra, there are methods, not only to extend the lifespan, but Tantra has methods to change the, destin the destiny of the Bhato being. Even though a karma to be human or, or to be an animal ripened through the power of, of practice of both the person and the person's teacher, it's possible for the destiny to be altered and that mind could go to a pure land or to a, at least a human rebirth instead of an animal or one of the heavens. That's possible. But ordinarily, without the profound practice of Tantra, uh, karmic lifespan can't be expand, extended. Now, we can die before the karmic lifespan is up. Um, there are, I, I wrote, wrote that down, actually. So, we can die before our karmic lifespan is up, what the Abhidhamma calls the exhaustion of merit or virtue, which means that we can, we're human, we can still live longer, but we've run out of the, the merit required to get the necessities for life, food, medicine, clothing, shelter. So we can die uh, due to this lack of merit to achieve these good things. We don't actually lose that unused lifespan. It will carry on the mind stream into a future life. The third way of dying is related to your question. Is, is said to be where there's a weakening uh, well, I was, I still can explain the death process. I mentioned that when the mind leaves the body at death, it is supported by this subtle physical energy called wind. Wind is the English. Uh, to Sanskrit is prana, Tibetan is lung, and I think the Chinese is qi. So there's a subtle physical energy which is a support, set, described as a support of the stream of consciousness. So it, that, that the wind has different aspects. The, the main type of wind, there are five different aspects, which no time to talk about those, but the main aspect is called the life-supporting wind that which supports life. This can be weakened, like prior to our karmic lifespan finishing, our, the life-supporting wind can become weak and we can experience an untimely death due to carelessness, uh, putting ourselves in a dangerous situation or doing things that 
could have been avoided. So we, we can weaken our life supporting wind by overindulging, say, in food or taking medicines, the wrong type of medicines, like drugs, poisonous things, or engaging in some risky actions or behaviour, not knowing what we're actually capable of doing, like thinking we're capable of doing something which we're not. So, you see, these psychological attitudes of carelessness, overindulgence weaken the life supporting wind and we can die in an untimely death so that cover the, your question yes. yeah um, so if we're not what we are that we look in the mirror at is self and it just dissolves in our next life and become another personality but our mind still that mind, then in that in that regard, karma doesn't really exist. Because karma doesn't really exist. No. Why? Well, because the personality that's dissolved ah. is no longer existing. Right. So you mean the person experiencing the result it's is not the same person as the cause? Is that what? Right. And the mind streams totally different, are separate altogether anyway. That's that last bit? The mind streams take us separate altogether and goes on anyway. Yeah, the mind stream continues, yes. Yes, yes, yes. But it's separate from each personality. Right. So, so what you're saying, I, I think, is that it's not right because the person, the new personality, who experienced the result, isn't the one who created the cause. Good, good, good question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Okay, do we exist or do we not exist? Everybody. <laughs> we exist. Okay, we do. I said earlier we do exist. How do we exist? That is the question. Well, I said there's a body in mind and there's the, the imputation of a name upon the body and mind. Neither the name John is, is the person John Smith, nor the body and mind which is suitable to be called John Smith. That's not John Smith. Suitable would be called John Smith. But when we check out, there's, we can't find John Smith anywhere in that body and mind. But John Smith exists. So the person who exists is said to be merely imputed upon a suitable basis. Merely imputed, merely labelled. That's the person who exists. In, in sim simplify it to the mere I. Right? That exists. Now, I remember I said that the baby, before the parents decided to call the baby John, was a person. It was the merely labelled Baby Smith. Right? Not John Smith, it was Baby Smith. It was a person. In the womb, everybody knew that John's mother was pregnant and there was a baby and there was a baby even there were names but there was certainly the, the baby, the fetus and even the, the fetus itself had a sense of I, mere I, merely labelled on the body and mind. So, the person who goes from life to life and bears the karmic imprints, this is a tricky one, is the merely labelled person. So, the merely labelled person who created the karma in the previous life is there is the same continuum into the present life and whenever that karma is experienced there is a continuity of the merely labelled I from life to life to life. And so that is the person who created the karma 
who bore the karmic imprints and who re experienced the result of the karma. So does some of that personality come with you? Uh, a lot of personality. Sure. We, we have so many innate um, seeds of knowledge, uh, of stupidity, of love, of anger. We have all of these seeds of mental qualities or mental characteristics. Yes, each newborn baby has the seeds. Now, whether those, you know, the seed of, of anger will manifest strongly depends upon the conditions. There's nature and there's nurture. Right? Yes, Buddhism agrees there is both nature and nurture. So, if the parental environment is very patient and kind and generous and mother, or usually father, doesn't get too angry, then the seeds of anger in John Smith are less likely to, to manifest and less likely to get stronger and stronger. But if the parents are different, there's domestic violence, etc., then the seeds of anger in the baby will be nurtured and the personality will be similar to the nurture. But there, there, so there are many conditions in society which influence our, I, I don't say predestined personality, but our personality traits. Yes, that's right. So both positive and negative. So, so each baby, we're all born with so much, so much, what do you say, garbage from past <laughs> lives and so much good stuff. A lot of the garbage is negative karma and disturbing emotions and the good stuff are positive karma and constructive emotions. So each baby is a bundle of all these tendencies and depending upon the experiences of life from within the womb onwards determines which ones will be enhanced or diminished during life. So the mind which goes from life to life and never ends anyway, it never began. So there's this person, there's always a person labeled upon this. The merely labeled person, person, yeah. So it's always connected to the mind. Uh, well, and whichever body it, it happens to conjoin with, with each rebirth. Yes, but it is, yeah, apart from the body, but I mean, it's not connected to the body when it dies, the body goes somewhere else. So, but it's always connected to the mind, to that continuum. That the merely labelled I is, is labelled upon whatever is existing at the moment. So during a rebirth, it's the combination of body and mind. During the bardo, it is the subtle wind and mind. And rebirth, it's, there's always some physical, mental combination which are the label, uh, basis of the label of the I. So basically, I am an operating system. So? I am an operating system. I has an operating system. I hate using analogies with computers because I don't understand computers. <laughs> uh, yes. We, we, we definitely are programmed. Is that what you... He, he said, he said um, the, the I is an operating system, not has. Yes, it is. The I is, the I is an operating, operating system. system. The I is whatever it is labelled upon. Okay. You're all rather crimping words, aren't you? Huh? The mind is such a... The mind is just a name of we don't know. It's such a subtle... We, I'm trying to tell you what it is. <laughs> So much, somehow, it's not, we don't know what it is. So the mind or the eye. Ah, uh, well. It's a definition of, of what it's. Well, look, at the beginning I said the definition of mind, like definition is so important. Th things can only be known in dependence upon their definition. They're defining characteristics. A defining characteristics defines what this is and not that. So, what are the defining characteristics of mind? Awareness. Clear and 
clear and awareness. Those are the defining... So whether you have this combination of clarity and awareness, you have mind. So, well, so I try to say, you, we know, our, we can know our minds. Our, whatever we're experiencing, whatever we're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, that subjective experience of our senses is mind. Huh? Why don't the memories come through as well? As the memories are mind. Memories are also mind. Oh, you mean memories of past lives? Yeah, because we, we get the resi- residue, but we don't remember it. The memories are there, but you can't gain access to them yet. You, there's so many things in this life which you can't remember. <laughs> Forget past lives. <laughs> So, our, our thoughts are mind. And then, along with our, the, the awareness, there's happiness, unhappiness, that's mind. There's love, hate, that's mind. There's generosity, mind. Patience, mind. Anger is mind. Jealousy is mind. These things we can experience. This is mind. We should be constantly mindful of our mind. Your mindfulness is supposed to be a very sure thing uh, psychological treatment. Well it is, as long as it's backed up with some awareness, some wisdom. What am I aware of? Why am I watching my mind? So, that is mind. And it's nothing else. It's not an entity in its own right. It's not a stuff. (laughs) All right. Okay. Now we've been going around the point. Ah. Oh. Look, I, I think it's useful to talk about the death experience because that is related to the karmic ripening, and karma is the main topic. So when we die, let's say it's the end of our karmic lifespan and we're uh, in the bed and we're slowly dying. So the end, if if you're a meditator, there are certain signs six months ahead that your karmic lifespan is finishing. And so meditators, like in Tibet, they are fully aware and they prepare for death. They resolve conflicts, they pay their debts, they get rid of their possessions, and they purify negative karma, like there are many practices to purify negative karma. They engage in all of these things, preparing for death. So they have skillful, very skillful method. Most of us, only, but only meditators can have that sort of insight, the, these subtle visions. The ordinary person... When they're dying, then, well, it's a us. we may have known for a few weeks beforehand. But first of all, the body and mind, the gross aspect is our body. So the body starts to weaken. You know, the limbs become weak and thin, difficult to move. And at that time, it's said that the dying person feels a sense of pressure on the chest as if something is sitting on the chest. Or, you know, the, the, a sense of suddenly falling. Now, going to sleep is exactly the same as dying. You don't go all the way. And so some of you may well have experienced you're half awake, half asleep, you're going to sleep, and there's a sense of pressure. And you get frightened. And you think, there's something sitting on me, there's a ghost. And but you can't move, you're paralysed. Or there's this, I've had this sense of suddenly falling and you put out your hands but you're actually lying flat on the bed, you're not falling but there's this sense of falling. So this is associated with the first stage of death as the body starts to weaken. 
then the mind starts to, to weaken as well. And the most active part of our mind is our feelings, our feelings of happiness, unhappiness, or neutral feeling. So the end of the first stage of death, as the body is beginning to weaken, there is an inner vision, a mental experience, and the inner vision is said to be like a, a, a mirage of water on the hot desert sand, like this shimmering silvery blue mirage. This is like an inner vision. It's, it's not a mirage, but it's an inner vision. Then you're going further into death and your feelings. You, there's no strong happiness, no strong unhappiness. Uh, it's sort of more neutral. Um, this, the gross sensory uh, experiences become weaker. At this point, the dying person will complain of a very dry mouth. The, the, the water, the liquids of the body stop functioning. The eyes become dry, the mouth becomes dry. And nurses have told me that they've ex observed this in dying people and often they give a little piece of ice for people to suck and that helps that dryness in the mouth. The ears begin to weaken so it's very difficult for them to hear. You have to shout into their ears for them to understand. The inner signs of this second stage of death as the feelings are weakening. The, if you have tinnitus, you have the buzzing in the ears, that will stop at last. Doctors can't stop it very much. And the, the, the vision, this inner vision changes from a mirage to like smoke, like a room filled with smoke. And I know that when I was a kid, I had some dental procedure on my gums, not the teeth. I remember vividly standing up and then wondering why the dental surgery was full of smoke. And then the next thing I was on the floor, I fainted. So fainting is the same as dying, as going to sleep. These visions occur, but usually quickly. But I can remember that, like it was in the 1940s, but I can still remember that vision of smoke. So at this time, the karma hasn't ripened yet, but there can be mental visions and uh, like horrible visions or pleasant visions. The horrible visions are an indication that a negative karma will ripen. Now, positive karmas and negative karmas, or virtuous and non-virtuous karmas, they were created where the mind's attitude was positive or negative, right? Virtuous or non-virtuous. The action of verbal relating to somebody, if it's abuse, negative. The mind is disturbed. If it's praise and kind words, then the mind is pleasant and undisturbed. So as we're dying, the mental attitude is of vital importance because a non-virtuous karmic potency can only ripen if the mind is non-virtuous. The soil is non-virtuous, agitated. So at this stage, as we're losing gross feelings, there can be agitation, you know, not wanting to die, angry at the relatives who are already fighting over the will, uh, angry at the doctors who haven't cured one. Just that, so the mind, and that will be associated with bad visions. If the mind is virtuous, then there can be pleasant visions, uh, uh, no disturbance, and that you know, the mind of love, Passion, faith, confidence in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ, who in that 
belief system are virtuous objects. So that faith in a virtuous object can indeed be a skillful way to go to heaven instead of going to hell. From the Buddhist point of view, there are heavens and there are hells. The point about trouble with heavens is that they're impermanent. You're not there forever. You can come back down again. The point is that the karma hasn't ripened yet. It only ripens during the third stage of dying when our mind loses its power to distinguish between things, particularly to distinguish between virtue and non-virtue. So we can't make our mind virtuous consciously or make it or avoid non-virtue consciously. We could have done that during the second stage, the loss of feeling. But at the third stage, the mind's getting weaker and weaker. So whatever aspects it, it is in, virtuous or non-virtuous, that will nurture, nurture a virtuous or non-virtuous karmic imprint for the next life. So this, this is the weakening of our power to distinguish things, um, our smell sense goes, and at this stage, the, vision, the inner vision of room like smoke becomes very dark. And like at night, if you poke a fire out in the open and the sparks rise up in the dark, so it's a vision of sparks in the darkness. At this stage, as we lose our capacity to distinguish or discriminate between virtue and non-virtue, that is when the karma for the future life ripens the rebirth result then just the fourth stage of death is, is where it ends when we stop breathing so the inner vision becomes instead of the sparks there's just total blackness with just a point of light like a ton they liken it to a candle burning at the bottom of a deep dark well I've no, I can only imagine what that's like so, so one goes through that experience and then one stops breathing. But the stopping of the breath is not the moment of death. As the latest issue of New Scientist has discovered, that one can be revived much longer time, especially if one died in a freezing situation. I think it happened recently to a tourist one can stay in a state of um, suspended animation and come out of it. We're talking about someone who's dying. In a near-death process, near-death experience, they talk about either a pleasant light or a dark space. But then the reverse happens. This can happen. Just as during the day, our mind can become sleepy or alert and it cycles so death death can doesn't all happen boom 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 one can start sinking and one will become more alert start sinking and alert and the time changes it can start six months before we die but only meditators can recognize what's going on so at this fourth stage one stops breathing now, the way it's described is that uh, there, there are visions in ordinary people, not meditators, uh, as the subtle energies come down towards the heart chakra, not the beating heart, but the heart chakra, there is a white experience, very subtle white. And then as the wind energies from the lower part of the body come up towards the heart chakra, there's a red, this deep, subtle red vision and then when they all come together at the heart chakra, there's like this darkness, total blackness. And then there's uh, the final vision is said to be the clear light, the most subtle vision of consciousness. So there is this combination of most subtle mind and most subtle wind is support and 
One can stay in that for up to three days after we stop breathing. Meditators can stay there for much longer. They can use that for meditating. Like the most important meditation is meditation on emptiness of the I that we think we are. Emptiness means it doesn't exist as we think it exists. It's merely labelled. And so that experience of emptiness is similar to the clear light. The clear light... uh, You see, one problem is that we grasp a real true me, a true Julia, because whenever we think I, to our mind there's the appearance of a real true me. It's a wrong appearance. A real true mum, real true dad, real true partner, real true children. Everything appears wrongly. And we just naturally grasp at that appearance to be true. That's our problem. But at this clear light vision, there's no appearance of true existence. For the ordinary being, this is not the wisdom realizing emptiness. But there is no appearance of inherent existence. And so it's a fantastic time to meditate on emptiness. But you have to be a highly skilled meditator to use that. So ordinary persons, they're they're totally unaware that this is happening. Um, They they cannot report it. So near-death happened way back, not during these subtle uh, visions of white, red, black visions and clear light. So at the point of death, is when the mind, the clear light mind, separates from the body. And like a, a balance, a beam balance, you know, as you put more weight on this side, this side goes up and then they cross. And this goes down and this goes up. So the, the new life is said to be like that, that immediately the reverse visions occur. You, you get black, red, white, light, so you get the reverse of these visions and the like waking up in a dream the bardo being appears and is totally influenced by karma and I've, I've described what happens if a human karma ripen then they will meet their future parents That's true. We, one can die instant, instantaneously. Um, so that means we should always maintain a virtuous mind because we can die at any moment. Death is just behind our left shoulder, according to Don Juan. If the, uh, during the clear line? Or, or? Yeah, that you, you're going to die. Oh, yeah. You know, that you are passing in that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. So a lot of people reach out for help for doctors and everything yeah. else. Is, that's not necessary, is it? It, it depends on the individual. Oh. It's good cover to get the right medicine and right surgery yeah. and the right treatment to live longer. Um, one can only really know what's the best thing to do if one has clairvoyance or if one's guru has clairvoyance and we have total confidence in the guru that we will follow the guru's instructions to take treatment and not treatment. It's like when my teacher, Lama Tutanyeshi, he he had rheumatic cardiac disease and uh, in the 70s, whenever a Western doctor examined him, they, you must have a valve replacement, you know. And so Lama checked with his guru, Kepche Trijang Rinpoche, a, a great yogi, a Buddha, who said it wouldn't be beneficial in that particular situation for Lama Yoshi. Now he lived another 10 years, and it did. All of this is an emanation of Lama Yeshi. 
there would be nothing here if it wasn't for Lama Yeshe. So, um, but the Bishop Show where they where the, the, the clairvoyance and she says, take the medicine. It will be good. Do it. So it's, it's, it's up to the individual. But we should just assume we're going to die at any moment and always have a good heart. Because that's the way to die. It's not only the way to die, it's the way to live. <laughs> Yep. Um, what do you say if a person goes to the experience of floating? Separating from the body. Separating, yeah. <coughs> I had the experience. It's incredible. Well, uh, the, the, the six main types of consciousness are the five senses, and the six is the mental consciousness. Mental consciousness has the capacity to be aware of sensory objects. And so it, it can see things, hear things, smell things, touch things. And there are situations where one does not die, but it's been described that the mental consciousness, usually under for ordinary people, sickness or you know, some unusual physiological situation, the mental consciousness can be aware as if of the body down there and things there. Um, I, one story that I read about was somebody again in the dental surgery who had a partial anaesthetic. <coughs> and that person told the dentist that during the surgery, I was as if I was up on the ceiling and looking down at it all happening. And the dentist naturally poo pooed and said, No. And then, so the, the person said, Well, what about that coin that's on top of the wardrobe? And there was, there was a coin on top of the wardrobe which couldn't be seen unless you were on the ceiling. <laughs> so it's a, a mental consciousness experience. Some people talk about astral body. Um, that's not a Buddhist term, but there's something like that. It's possible. Yeah. I'm wondering is past life regression a similar process? So? Uh, I'm wondering is past life regression a similar process to what you just described? Past life regression. Regression. Oh, I see. Take it back. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, some people remember past lives spontaneously. Uh, in Buddhism, it says that every fetus in the womb has the karmic clairvoyance, that it's aware of a previous life. And that can even stay into the present life. And but of course they can't talk about it until they're one or two years old. And then parents say, be quiet and eat your cornflakes. Um, but a lot of these past life recalling children have been investigated. You know, there's a famous book by American, I think it was a physician, Stevenson, 20 cases suggestive of reincarnation, where he, uh, he investigated similar stories and it's incredible to read um, hypnosis I really don't know but the memories are there through meditation one can revive the memories of past lives so they are they're born on the mind and the mind's not destroyed the, the brain is necessary in establishing memories, but the brain is not memories. And this is one thing, scientifically, the brain has to be memory. There has to be, uh, going back to our computer analogy, there has to be some sort of recording system in the brain. And yet, to, to, for me, I can remember things which happened so long ago, 
I've already mentioned one which happened in the 1940s. And it's so clear. And the whole events and everything. And so from a scientific point of view, that's the cell, the, the, the dendrites, the connections. But the brain's changing all the time. Anyway, uh, the memories are there. Hypnosis, maybe. Uh, well, we've run out of time. So tonight we've revised last Wednesday and we've talked about karma. I've just given a general presentation of karma in relationship to the, the heavy, non virtuous action of abuse, abusive speech. But we could also talk about karma, the heavy karmas, which are natural negative karma. They're, they're not negative because Buddha said so. They're killing, they're the Ten Commandments, really. Killing a sentient being deliberately, stealing from sentient beings, harming sentient beings through sexual indulgence, harsh speech, slander, uh, lying, idle gossip, and then the mental karmas of maliciousness, of covetousness, and of ignorance, mistaken beliefs. So uh, these are presented, the, the causes of those actions, and what, what defines one of those actions, and what is not one of those actions. Um, but we, we didn't have time to go that. Maybe quickly next week we will. And uh, next week also, I want to talk about, again, karma, but the 12 links of interdependent origination. So interdependent, again, the, the main uh, thrust of these talks is to understand the interdependent nature of existence. Why do I exist? Why does this happen to me or not me? Um, there is an answer. And once we know the answer of, which is twofold, karma and disturbing emotions, then we can do, we can do something about it. Because only we have access to our minds. Only we can train our mind in virtue and abandon non-virtue and purify our karma. That's something that we can do that a Buddha cannot do for us. Right? Buddhas have done it to their own minds and they've taught us how to do it. But we have to do it ourselves because we are the only ones who have access to our mind. So this is good news. <laughs> if we understand it, it's fantastic. There is something that can be done. Not, maybe not to help the world yet, but we can help this individual and as we progressively help this individual, we help all those who depend upon us. Our friends, our relatives, people in the street, animals, insects. You know, we, we start becoming an emanation of kindness and love and compassion. And that can influ influence society. And society is just a collection of in individuals. We're part of that collection. If society is disturbed, anger, greedy, full of capitalists, like last night's film, are uh, trouble. But if one or more individuals in society are kind and generous and friendly and good heart, society can only get better. Okay. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.